So um, my paper is going to be a little bit like Max's. It's basically a shorter version of what I'm working on for my honors thesis. So um, I'm going to read for a few minutes, and then we'll look at some pictures at the end. On August 23rd, 1865, Captain Henry Wirtz was charged with one count of conspiracy to, quote, injure the health and destroy the lives of soldiers in the military service of the United States, as well as 13 counts of murder in violation of the laws and customs of war, end quote. The trial took place during arguably one of the most tumultuous period, periods in American history. The Civil War had formally ended seven months before. Shortly after, on April 15th, 1865, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in Washington, D.C. Struggling to come to terms with the end of the bloodiest war in American history, as well as the sudden death of the president that had led the North into and out of that war, the public <coughs> latched on to Wirtz's trial. Thanks to expansive coverage in newspapers and magazines, Henry Wirtz became an overnight celebrity. His alleged atrocities at Andersonville Prison Camp in Andersonville, Georgia, became the rallying cry for Northerners seeking retribution for what they viewed to be brutal Southern acts of war. Again, it is important to note that during the, the during the context during which Wirtz's crimes at Andersonville took place. The Civil War marked the first time in American history in which prisoners of war were detained in large numbers. Prison camps were built throughout the North and South on a massive scale. Between 1860 and 1865, there were roughly 150 prison camps in operation throughout the United States. However, due to the relative newness of prison management, many of the men in charge of the camps had little to no experience. Efforts on both sides to find an efficient and cost-effective way to manage the prisons opened the door to a number of operational issues, including shortages of food, necessary supplies, and general overcrowding. It was not uncommon for prisons in both the North and the South to have high mortality rates. For example, Elmira Prison Camp, located in New York, had a death rate of nearly 25%. Southern prison camps had a particularly difficult time with operational issues for two reasons. First, the North implemented the Anaconda Plan in 1861, which blockaded all Confederate ports. The goal was to starve the South into submission, and as the war moved forward, it became apparent that the plan was highly successful. This especially affected prisoners of war. Second, the North halted the prisoner exchange program in 1863. This had allowed for occasional straight across exchanges of Northern and Southern prisoners. Although this benefited the North as well as the South, it was discontinued because Southerners refused to exchange northern black soldiers and civilians. Paroled prisoners were not allowed to return to the battlefields, but there were reports of southern prisoners rejoining Confederate unions, or, uh, excuse me, Confederate units and rejoining to various fronts. In a war of attrition, it became apparent that the exchange system benefited the south more than the north and was thus discontinued. Camps on both sides became swollen with prisoners, and due to the lack of necessary supplies in the south, Confederate camps witnessed a marked increase in preventable deaths. In 1863, it became evident that a new prison needed to be built to alleviate some of the overcrowding. Andersonville, located deep in the interior of the state of Georgia, was a strategic position as it offered protection from advancing Union troops and was located close to a railroad line, providing efficient transportation to and from the prison. Trees close to the site provided timber to construct the camp, and a nearby stream was to form the center of the camp. The prison, formally recognized as Fort Sumter, opened its doors in February 1864. Henry Wirtz arrived in April. Problems arose immediately. The prison capacity was 10,000, but the limit was reached and exceeded within the first two months of operation. Conditions deteriorated rapidly. The stream, which provided the only source of drinking water, became contaminated with feces, cooking grease, and other unsavory items. The lack of food, shelter, medicine, and clothing was pronounced. After a short period in the prison, many of the men were naked, starving, and disease-stricken. Scurvy, typhoid, cholera, and diarrhea were the main causes of death. Any wound, even vaccination marks, was almost guaranteed to become gangrenous, which resulted in amputation and usually death. Andersonville was in operation for roughly 18 months, during which close to one-third of the population, or nearly 13,000 prisoners, perished. After examining the historiography between 1865 and 1921 concerning the trial, I discovered that the books, pamphlets, and essays supposedly focusing on words in Andersonville actually seemed to have an underlying message. Wirtz's guilt became inseparable from the idea of Southern guilt. Andersonville became the symbol of Southern atrocity, brutality, and illegitimacy to the North, but Southerners used those same symbols of Wirtz and Andersonville to challenge the representations and to redefine the South's role in the war. 
For example, in 1866, Ambrose Spencer, a Southerner turned Union sympathizer after the war, published a narrative of Andersonville. To Spencer, the book served as a, quote, imperfect recital of the survivors of Andersonville's wrongs and sufferings, but also hinted at a more serious implication of the camp, that the murders and other outrages had been committed, quote, under the fictitious plea of a struggle for independence, end quote. This statement made a narrative of Andersonville one of the first post-trial books to determinedly state that in participating in the war, the South's primary intention was not to gain independence. Rather, Spencer implied that Southerners actually wanted to torture and murder prisoners of war, that Southerners were barbaric, cruel, and enjoyed acting out their fantasies of killing Northerners. Other books followed. In 1890, Jefferson Davis posthumously published his most important work, A Short History of the Confederate States of America. In a chapter entitled War Prisons, Northern and Southern, Davis gave his own opinion on what happened at Andersonville and other camps, while at the same time defending Henry Wirtz. By arguing that Wirtz was not solely to blame for the deaths at Andersonville, Davis not only questioned Wirtz's guilt, but the ability of the military, military commission to fully exact an innocent or guilty verdict during his trial. More subtly, Davis had shifted some of the blame the South held as a whole onto the shoulder, shoulders of the North by claiming that the breakdown of the prisoner exchange program was mostly to blame for Northern deaths in Southern prisons. Norton Parker Chipman, the judge advocate of Wirtz's trial, responded with the horrors of Andersonville rebel prison in 1891, and again with a similar work in 1911 in response to the erection of the Wirtz Monument in Andersonville, Georgia in 18, 1910. I recognize that Wirtz and Andersonville have become, in the eyes of the Northerners who lived through the Civil War and Wirtz's trial, the epitome of Southern wartime atrocity. However, I found that there were two pressing issues that had been left unanswered by the historiography between 1865 and 1921, and in other more recent works. First, out of the many Confederate prison camps, why was it that Andersonville, despite its lack of extraordinary features compared to its sibling camps, became the most notorious Civil War prison camp, and indeed one of the most famous prisoner camps, prisoner of war camps in the world? Second, why was it that out of the hundreds of Confederate officers working at these prison camps, Henry Wirtz was targeted as the sole man to be put on trial for his responsibilities at Andersonville? These are simple questions to ask, but with difficult answers. Indeed, no one has ever actually attempted to answer them. Although my research is not entirely complete at this time, I have, I have come up with a couple of theories um, in the attempt to answer these questions. First and foremost, Andersonville was one of the few camps to have pictures taken of the survivors. These are graphics, so apologize. Bell Island also had pictures taken by the federal government. However, Andersonville was the only camp that had these pictures distributed on a massive scale. Etchings and sketches of the actual photographs appeared in magazines like Harper's Weekly, which was at the time one of the most popular and well-read publications in the country. For the first time in American history, photographic journalism brought the war home. Atrocities committed hundreds of miles away and now felt much more tangible and immediate than in previous wars. It is reasonable to suggest that photography played a significant role in the development of Andersonville as a symbol. Also important to note is the large number of journals and memoirs that were published by camp survivors immediately after the war. Although many prisoners had served time at a variety of camps, their stories focused largely on the cruel, miserable conditions at Andersonville, not on the conditions at Lee and Richmond, for example. These stories were often extremely graphic, and they were also published in newspaper editorials and magazines like Harper's Weekly across the country. It is important to recognize that by the time he arrived in Washington, D.C., Henry Wirtz was the leading character in a story read over and over again by the American public. He was so popular that a professional photographer was hired to document his execution. Henry Wirtz was, by many accounts, the perfect scapegoat. He was European and spoke little English. He was a Catholic in a time of anti-Catholic sentiment in the United States. Most importantly, though, he was an unknown figure with no political ties and no friends. This is probably the reason that higher-ranking officers like Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederacy, or John H. Winder, commandant of the entire Confederate prison camp system, were not even tried after the end of the war. The key to Wirtz's execution was Andersonville. Without the camp's notoriety, it is unlikely that Wirtz would have been targeted at all, and thus would have failed to reach the infamous position he holds in American history as the only Confederate officer executed after the Civil War. Uh, 
involved in the exchange activity? Um, well, it was initiated in 1860 and it ended in the beginning of 1863, I believe. Um, so it was in the thousands. I don't have an exact number, but it was, you know, it was a pretty significant practice. Um, and in part, that's what kept the, the numbers in the camps prior to the halting of that so low. Um, and that's why you don't see problems until after that. Um, so it was a significant number. Was there any uh, testimony by works? I mean, I mean, he obviously couldn't speak English very well, it sounds like, but was there any documentation regarding that? Yeah, um, he actually did not testify at the trial. Um, I think in one of the pictures that I have, yeah, so the one um, on the left, you can see him, he's laying down on a, uh, on a little lounge there. He, he was sick during a lot of the trials, so that's a pretty significant thing. Um, he didn't testify, but he did have a statement read um, that he produced, it was read by his lawyers. Um, and it basically argued that the military commission didn't have jurisdiction to try him. Um, another issue that he brought up was he was charged for these 13 murders, but no one ever could name the people that were murdered. They were completely mysterious figures. Um, so he challenged that as well. There were a couple of other things um, that he discussed. You know, they had over a hundred witnesses testify against him, um, most of which were preserved war survivors. And so he he um, he really protested a lot of that because a lot of it was very circumstantial and questionable. 